Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Barbara Vickery for a talk on secondary stroke, stroke prevention. Dr. Vickery is the system chair for the Department of Neurology at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. She earned her MD at Duke University School of Medicine and her MPH at the UCLA School of Public Health. She completed postgraduate clinical training in medicine and neurology at the University of Washington in Seattle and then research fellowships in the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at UCLA and the RAND UCLA Center for Health Policy Study. Dr. Vickery specializes in translating clinical evidence into improvements in routine medical practice that benefit patients' health. Her wide-ranging accomplishments include demonstrating that collaboration among healthcare systems, community organizations, and caregivers can improve quality of care and outcomes for dementia patients. She also designed healthcare delivery innovations ranging from better control of post-stroke risk factors in underserved populations to new ways to care for veterans with Parkinson's disease. Dr. Vickery was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in 2011. She leads a five-year stroke prevention intervention research program in health disparities funded by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. She serves on the Science Committee of the American Academy of Neurology and is Vice President of the American Neurological Association. Please join me in welcoming <coughs> Dr. Robert Vickery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Boy, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and to talk about um, um, work I've been doing for a couple of decades now. Um, and I'm um, going to launch right in and um, uh, to talk about really the central focus of this is about health disparities. And this is a figure that illustrates um, uh, age adjusted mortality rates from 1991 to 2000. Uh, top line is African American males, white males, African American females, white females. And um, you can observe a couple of things in this slide, but basically, um, there were uh, higher rates uh, of uh, mortality among blacks compared to whites as well as men compared to women. Um, and this was really pretty flat over this period and the authors of this paper said if we had, if we had the rates of um, death for blacks were, were the same as those for whites, there would have been 886,000 lives uh, saved or different over that same time period. So I think this really illustrates that when we talk about disparities, it's not abstract, it's not um, that minor, it, it's actually a pretty significant impact overall and we certainly haven't gotten to the root of that as I'll, I'll show you. And then I wanna link um, this, this research I'm gonna share with you to um, a figure that perhaps is familiar to everyone here now. Um, this is really adapted from um, uh, an Institute of Medicine Clinical Research Roundtable that was published around 2003, 2004 in JAMA, um, where um, this was pre-CTSA period, and basically um, this, this uh, committee um, reviewed um, the literature, spoke to experts, and, and identified um, that there were two major roadblocks to getting all the basic science research that had been funded through NIH et cetera, into the ultimate goal, which is to improve population health. And it sounds so logical, right? But at the time, um, there were a number, I think, of uh, NIH Institute directors who were, when they went up for their yearly visit to Congress or whatever, uh, or, the, or the overall director, they would be asked, what, what has all the investment of society in the institutes uh, yielded in terms of um, uh, better health for our constituents and for the population. And of course, there are many examples, but um, there was a sense that, and one reason this committee was commissioned, was that we weren't optimizing this pipeline. And indeed, they found there were two roadblocks. One is the, the more well-known one, translation from basic neuroscience to human studies. But the second one is, let's say you've done a randomized trial, you've shown efficacy. It turns out that you don't, publish it in a journal and the next day, population health is better because that uh, finding has been taken up. And in fact, there's a whole host of roadblocks falling in this area, which could sometimes called outcomes research, implementation research. Sometimes people break this down into multiple steps, but it's basically saying that there are a lot of factors 
that um, uh, have to be addressed going from findings in a, of efficacy in trials before we've, we've seen the, um, uh, the improvements. So one model for thinking about this, again, this may be very familiar to you folks, is, is from Ro Everett Rogers, um, a communications professor at the University of New Mexico, who I think wrote the first edit edition of Diffusion of Innovations in the early 60s. And about every five or 10 years, he updated it. It's really a fascinating book if anybody's at all interested because he doesn't focus on medicine. That's one area. But basically, as a general principle, there are, um, um, diffusion of innovations follows an S-shaped curve, and there are characteristics of early adopters and later adopters. And basically, the premise is that how we um, make changes in what we do, how innovations are taken up, whether it's a certain new form of hybrid a seed among farmers in the Midwest, or whether it's uh, whether to get the uh, you know the next version of your iPhone, or whether to shift from carousels to PowerPoint. And I had to stop using that example when a medical student one day said, "I've always wondered what a carousel looked like, a slide carousel, right?" So that was the end of that example. But but basically, whatever um, um, the path, um, whatever the route, we tend to do it by talking to peers through communication channels. Um, so, um, one goal of, um, of um, uh, trying to promote greater adoption uh, or more rapid adoption of innovations is to move this curve this way, right? So this is percent adoption and this is time. And there's all kinds of strategies that have to do with, there, there's some, again, common principles um, from the literature that cross fields that, that are characteristics both of the adopters and of things that can help accelerate that adoption. But one of the things that can happen is that there's incomplete diffusion. And when that happens for healthcare, um, for new innovations in healthcare, and they're different by racial and ethnic group, um, then, then um, this is an example of incomplete diffusion of innovations. So I'll give you a real life example. This actually is, um, we were just talking about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Hicks's study, and um, that was um, a study of um, a national representative sample of people in care for HIV in the late 90s. And sort of completely um, serendipitously, during the time, so they were out in the field, they got a national representative sample, they were looking at all kinds of things around characteristics of people in HIV and the health care they got. But, um, and they were following this cohort, a national cohort over two years, completely serendipitously, um, the antiretroviral therapy um, was developed and uh, became available during the period that they were tracking these folks. So one thing that they could measure was the diffusion of that innovation, which basically changed this from a, a disease you died from to a chronic disease. So a, a really dramatic innovation um, a treatment, and uh, sure enough, there's a couple of things we can observe from this. This is percent exposed, meaning people who, who uh, were started on this therapy over this time frame in the cohort. And as you see over time, although you could say it took two years, there was a diffusion of that innovation from when it was just available to uh, pretty high rates toward the end of that period, which is good news. But we also see that there's incomplete diffusion for blacks compared to whites, so that there was an increase in use of the therapy among blacks, but it was always lower, and at the end was lower than for whites, so there was persistence of disparities. So that would be an example of incomplete diffusion. Another is um, uh, uh, in uh, muscular dystrophy, um, it's a rare neurologic disorder, and no one was really looking for this, but there was a study out of the CDC to look at um, death record data over about a 20-year period. And um, over that period, although we haven't figured out, obviously, how to, how to um, reverse this disorder or prevent it, um, there were therapies developed to um, better manage or prevent cardiac complications. Um, but what they saw when they looked at this by race was that, so the median age of death between 1985 and 2005, so this innovation 
which you could say is better management prevention of cardiac complications in muscular dystrophy patients, was being introduced and it diffused into those who were white, white males, the median age of death increased over that period, but among blacks they saw that it was flat. And so um, whenever you see that kind of data, first I, I can tell you I was sitting on a, actually at a NINDS council at the time, we had a representative from one of the muscular dystrophy associations and she said, you know, when this study came out we had no idea that there was any kind of a problem like this. So, Having the data helps because you can identify, wow, there's something here that we want to look into. But the next step has to be, well, what's driving that? What's behind it? There was some inklings from this study that it might have been related to worse access to care um, because of what they saw um, on the death certificates about location of death, which was more likely to be in an ambulance um, or an emergency room for blacks compared to whites. Um, but in any event, this kind of uh, finding can spur, as it has with that group, um, uh, more research into figuring out why and then how to, how to prevent that. So what are disparities in health? The World Health Organization has defined that as differences in health which are not only unnecessary and avoidable, but in addition are considered unfair and unjust. And these have a big economic impact. There's more recent data, but but at least from uh, 10 years ago, the combined costs of health inequalities and premature death in the U.S. was estimated at $1.24 trillion. So um, those are, um, again, very meaningful numbers. Um, going back, um, really, it was 1985 when there was a landmark report that was published. Again, just to give people context, even for those who weren't born yet in 1985, that. It wasn't like we always knew or we'd always documented, but this was a major report commissioned by the secretary of HHS at the time, <clears throat> Margaret Heckler. And um, uh, sh they, this committee um, looked at the literature and found that there were um, significant, there was evidence of disparities for African Americans and not a lot of data on other groups. They highlighted some key areas and this report was taken up by um, and, and implemented um, across at least a lot of government agencies in terms of policies. So for example, the reason why when you fill out on an NIH form your report about how many uh, minorities were enrolled in your clinical research studies, that's actually a policy that came out of um, uh, the um, findings of this report, um, as well as a number of other things. But basically, um, uh, uh, this, this report and subsequent ones were hailed as is one word generating force for an accelerated national assault on the persistent health disparities, led to creation of Office of Minority Health and a ho whole host of other things. Periodically these reports have been revisited and um, um, we'll get, get to where the updates are. This is a, a model of the link between race and health disparities from King and Williams. It's 20 years old. And I think the main point to make here is that most of this has to do with um, things related to racism, political factors, how these affect health practices, environmental stress, so forth. A lot of socioeconomic factors are related to it. So really the focus of research should, should probably be on that link between um, uh, evidence and um, um, uh, outcome, and I'll, and I'll give you some more examples there. So turning to stroke, um, uh, there's a whole lot of data that there are racial and ethnic disparities in stroke, and I'm just going to show you some of these here, whether it's ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, whether it's blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Americans, um, in every group on at least some metric of, of that, um, of stroke, incidence or occurrence or mortality, there's evidence of disparities. Um, even though stroke mortality overall has improved uh, over time in the U.S., uh, at least one study out of the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky uh, region, a longitudinal cohort study, found that while the overall incidence of stroke decreased, there was no, among the whole population among whites, among blacks, there was no change over time. So again, some suggestions that while there's some progress overall, um, there remain, like you saw for the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, there remain disparities even though there may have been some progress overall. 
And then further, when you go back and look at, um, well, what could prevent stroke occurrence and, and the bad consequences, uh, it turns out that um, a lot of it is driven by risk factors that um, we know are modifiable, that we have lots of evidence-based treatments for, like hypertension, smoking, um, uh, abdominal obesity, diet, regular physical activity. I mean, this is stuff all f very familiar to um, um, internists. Um, and these are all, we have tons of, of uh, pretty effective therapies out there. And uh, a lot of uh, stroke risk is attributable to these. And yet again, uh, so we could go back and say, are there differences by race in the occurrence of these race risk factors? Um, across the board, again, for many of these um, among blacks, Hispanics, there are differences in these rates. Hispanics have a higher prevalence of metabolic syndrome. High proportion of Korean adults are current smokers. Here's some data on high blood pressure um, among, um, these are different time cohorts among black men. Uh, rates are pretty high. This is from the National Health Interview Survey. Uh, black women, and it's lower for um, whites. Um, among uh, physical activity, we see that, um, uh, again, higher rates of adequate physical activity among whites and lowest among Hispanics. Again, sort of across the board, um, uh, uh, a number of disparities in um, known risk factors for stroke. So the real challenge, as I said, there were updates to the 1985 Heckler Report, and uh, the Institute of Medicine issued a report on disparities in 2002, and basically there was sort of a turning point there, at least in the, in the thinking about where we should be putting our resources, uh, saying that the challenge, okay, we've now been measuring a lot about his disparities. We've, we've kind of gotten to the root of a number of, of things that are driving it, but really we need to be developing and Im implementing strategies to reduce and eliminate them. And so that's really what you see is the focus now, and it certainly um, has led to some of the opportunities we've had with uh, 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 the funding that I'll describe to you. So, um, and I just want to make the point again that there's a very tight link between outcomes research or that step from going from efficacy studies and, tri and, and efficacy trials to better population health and eliminating disparities. Because again, that's where we really think the money is. It's, it's not that we're finding that we need to identify a lot of different treatments. Um, or It's really we have a lot of known treatments. They're not getting diffused or implemented as adequately among um, uh, under-resourced minority populations. And that's this is just re-illustrating that point that, that this is where um, we're focusing. And um, to take that last step, tease it apart a little more. This is the step on the prior slide that was the efficacy step. So let's say we've got a new treatment for hypertension or an efficacy trial about a smoking cessation strategy. Often, going back to the diffusion model, there's little diffusion, so there's lower, delayed, or inappropriate use of, of new treatments. Um, so, uh, and then that means that we're not getting the improvements in population health. If there was high diffusion, then we should see that translated into better health. If, if um, treatments for um, preventing or ameliorating cardiac complications and muscular dystrophy, those are, there's studies that show we can do that. If, we, if that's diffused more highly into a higher proportion of the population, we should get better population health. When that doesn't happen naturally, which is pretty typical, then um, there's a whole body of research, again, that's, this is this implementation research, outcomes research, to focus on interventions that are based on knowledge about identified barriers, try to implement them, and figure out ways to scale them up if they're effective. So that's what the focus is. And I'm going to switch now and tell you about some work, as you heard, we've done some work in dementia care delivery, Parkinson's disease, um, and then um, uh, um, uh, work over the last few years in stroke prevention. This has been in Los Angeles County, um, where I, I was on the faculty at UCLA for uh, 25 years. And um, we've, um, uh, it's a fascinating um, uh, environment and, um, in terms of thinking about diversity and disparities, both. Um, this is a slide adapted from Jonathan Fielding, who was the um, head of the Department of Public Health in LA County. And, 
and, and now uh, has a public health school named after him at UCLA, the Fielding School of Public Health. Um, there's about 10 million people there. It would be the seventh or eighth largest state, depending on the year. Uh, there's a lot of diverse neighborhoods and living conditions. There's 88 cities. It may be hard to imagine. There's really very little mass transit. And it's, uh, uh, the population is uh, over, the county is 4,000 square miles. About half is where most of the population is. There's over 100 languages spoken in the county, and over half of residents sometimes are always speak a language other than English at home. Um, and as you can see, nearly half Hispanic. This is from 10 years ago, and these numbers have probably, I'm sure they've moved more toward closer to half, if not over half. Whites are uh, about a third, and uh, blacks and um, um, Asians uh, comprise about another quarter to a third. So we had an opportunity um, uh, about seven, eight years ago to um, the uh, American Heart Association was funding outcomes research centers across the U.S. Most of them were focused on, ended up focused on cardiac conditions. Um, we felt like there was an opportunity here to propose uh, a center focused on stroke and stroke prevention in underserved minority populations. And one of the center trials within that, one of the trials within our center, which had several projects and some cores and a training component, was uh, to design and test a sustainable intervention for risk factor control in the safety net setting um, among um, under-resourced minorities in Los Angeles County. And, and I want, looking back, um, I have to say I'm uh, a little, it, it's, it, research is really a process of learning a lot along the way, and one of the things you can do is be attentive to what you're learning. And um, uh, these kinds of interventions are pretty complex. Uh, and it's, so that makes it both exciting and challenging. So I'm going to walk you through the path from that project and where it's led to some current research we're doing. So first we looked at, you know, is this really an issue we should tackle? We knew that stroke is a, is, has a leading cause of disability uh, outside of mortality. A um, majority of people are left with some uh, uh, deficits and um, functional impairment after stroke. We know that you can um, reduce the, uh, and about a, th a third of, um, a quarter to a third of strokes are, are recurrent strokes. So think about it, there's a whole, anyone who's had a first stroke, you've identified a high risk population right there who you can intervene in. You don't have to be looking at the whole primary care population. You can uh, actually do a lot of focusing on people who have had an initial event that puts them at high risk for a subsequent event regardless of all their other risk factors. But most of them have a lot of those other risk factors that I mentioned, and they're not well controlled. Um, people in the safety net, by that I mean our, our county health care system in Los Angeles County, are primarily low income and uninsured from disadvantaged groups, and their risk factors are not well controlled. So we dug a little deeper and both collected some data of our own and then looked at published data to try to tease apart what are some of the factors that, that are associated with why um, it's tougher to get um, uh, risk factor control. So one in eight Latino elders in the system have actually zero years of education. They might have moved from rural Mexico and actually had no formal public education at all. Um, some, at least before the Affordable Care Act, there was uh, serious problems with lack of access to outpatient care. You could get hospitalized, but tough to get into outpatient care. Sometimes an outpatient neurology clinic would be six months. Um, few health or education programs, enormous language barriers, um, and a lot of cultural barriers to changing diet. And as I said, just enormous transportation barriers. This is Los Angeles County. As I said, most people are living in the lower 2,000 square miles. The uh, colored H's boxes are the four Los Angeles County um, uh, public health care uh, facilities. Um, they're spread out over this region. Um, and what the red dots are are is a consecutive cohort of stroke admissions. So as you can see over this area, there's a lot of distance between people and where they live and the medical centers where we often invite them to receive their care. So we went through a series of um, 
um, analyses to look at what were the factors that seemed to be driving the disparities in secondary stroke prevention. For example, low patient knowledge about stroke, low health literacy. I mean, typically, like you're out, you're coming out the door, and someone says, "Oh, by the way, you know, um, follow your blood pressure medication, you know, so you don't have another stroke." I mean, this is. Um, not really an effective strategy for understanding about risk and about what to do if there's another stroke. So um, uh, people have had a pretty major event. They're focusing on a lot of things, and there are a lot of things going on. And that kind of passive, transient um, um, communication is, is just not going to be effective. Uh, there are language barriers, terrible co transportation problems. So you might say, well, you can get medication free in the county his health system. So, and I can tell you that um, what a patient has to do is they typically may have to have a family member take off work, drive them, or or take three buses or four buses to the local to the nearest one of those four medical centers, uh, sit in a waiting area um, uh, until you're with with like a hundred people for half a day while you're waiting for your number to show up so you can go pick up your free medication. So it may be that, um, that there are um, things that people can access, but there's a lot of barriers to, to, to that actually happening that are um, very tough for um, low-income people to, to overcome. A lot of issues around uh, phone. It, uh, uh, it turns out that if you're worried that the hospital's going to call you about your bill, you may not pick up if they're calling you about an appointment or about a reminder to fill your medication. So there's, there's uh, all kinds of interesting uh, twists on that. And so we took each one of these kinds of issues and we thought about what might be the ingredient of an effective um, multi-component intervention because we didn't think there was going to be one thing uh, that was going to fix this problem. And the kinds of strategies that we came up with, for example, around stroke uh, literacy was perhaps using group clinics. Uh, printing an image of their stroke and reviewing that together in that kind of setting. Obviously needing bilingual providers and staff at key points. Um, home blood pressure monitoring. Um, for those of you in cardiology, I was at some, uh, I was giving a talk and one of the cardiologists raised their hand and said that the, the development and, of the home blood pressure monitor completely you know, was, a, was a major influence on better um, blood pressure control among um, people at risk for cardiac disease because it took it out of people having to come to see their doctor to get their blood pressure taken. And of course, now, again, it's routine. You can go to a pharmacy, you can go anywhere and get your blood pressure taken, and, and home blood pressure monitors are cheap and widely available. But if you don't know how to read, if you don't understand what to do with the readings, there's still a whole lot of barriers around a low literacy population for using it in a way that can lead to a doctor making a decision about uh, or, a, or, a, or an allied uh, provider making a decision about changing that. Um, there was a lot of drop off of follow up and a need for continuity um, from that transition from in the hospital to the outpatient setting and for a while. And um, a lot of it is driven, or about half of it is driven by medication management. And a lot of what we would see is people would have discontinuous follow up. They may not ever get into primary care. And even if they did, maybe the primary care docs didn't know, well, what were the targets for the stroke patient? And so people would stop taking their aspirin after an ischemic stroke or, or whatever. So really a need to hone in on that. Um, and so a model that we um, built this on is, is one that's been around for a while. I don't know if it's familiar to people here, the chronic care model. Um, developed by Ed Wagner at a group health in, in the Seattle region, gosh, uh, maybe 30 years ago. It was really very prescient because the model includes really looking completely differently at chronic care delivery, going from fee-for-service doctor visit-based care to thinking about maybe we ought to have different providers involved in the care, like, like involvement of people who could do more of the education or self-management training around how do you follow your blood pressure, Decision support. Again, this was the 80s, and they were thinking about use of technology to help guide decision making <clears throat> so that you wouldn't have to carry around in your head. Now, what is the target for LDL in a, in a, in a stroke patient? Using clinical information systems, um, 
which are now um, more advanced, although we haven't mastered them. Um, and um, uh, also a component of the community, and I'm gonna come back to that. And in this model, which is really, I think of as a framework, but a very useful one, the idea is if you put these components together, you're gonna have um, better informed, activated patients, a better, um, a more efficiently working and a prepared uh, care team and better outcomes. Um, and this has been uh, really widely promoted over time. When we, we liked this framework and we used this, we took the different components of the chronic care model, the different dimensions, and designed components of this stroke prevention intervention that we thought would map onto it. So for example, the idea that we needed an NP or a PA who could prescribe because in the county system, it was gonna be really hard for them to nag someone else to prescribe. Um, uh, we initially, our first project, we looked at group clinics that were, that were very popular in the literature at the time in diabetes and shown to be effective. A lot of telephone care coordination, um, report cards, other tools given to patients, the home blood pressure monitor, really trying to think about ways to help the patients figure out how to track and manage their uh, risk factors and then use of a, of a registry. Again, the idea is you wanna look across a population and follow them and not just pick out people who keep coming back to your clinic, but really looking across the whole population and using decision support in the forms of guidelines and so forth. So we looked at those different components and um, uh, put together our, uh, through partnerships with the Los Angeles County Medical Center and had, as I said, funding through the American Heart Association to do a trial. Now, why were we doing a trial? Because otherwise, people would say, well, it's very nice that you put together these packages, but I'm an administrator in this health system, and I, I don't, first, I don't have the money to pay for it, and I, you don't haven't brought me evidence that this is better than the way we're currently practicing. So this is about evidence generation around care delivery so we compared this to usual care. We randomized 410 patients. We put in place everything I described, right? The nurse practitioners who had algorithms, a tracking system, a series of group clinics to go over lifestyle issues, uh, a telephone coordination of care, and followed people through 12 months. Um, and this is a breakdown of more of the ingredients of that intervention. Um, and I just want to show this slide just to illustrate again, this is a very um, under-resourced population. It was uh, over 90% um, non-white, non-Hispanic, 80% um, of people born outside the US, a third with an eighth grade or less education, also younger uh, for stroke patients, and that's pot partly because of uh, if you have, if you were older, you had Medicare, you might be taken elsewhere. So we then tested this because we needed this evidence. Um, I wanna make a point that we had to pick one primary outcome because we always do that in studies, right? It turns out there was no composite risk store, risk reduction index for stroke prevention. No, no really uh, a good one and certainly not in secondary stroke prevention. And I want you to think about it. This intervention actually was not just about blood pressure. It was about all the risk factors, lipids, taking your antithrombotic medication, diet, physical activity, smoking. But we could measure all those things as secondary outcomes, but we didn't have a way of aggregating them. And that was a limitation in the literature. So uh, we carried this out and uh, these were the findings. Um, we did not have an impact on blood pressure relative to usual care, although we were surprised to see that um, both usual care and intervention groups had a reduction in blood pressure over 12 months, and this is in a tough population in the county system. Uh, we did see a very little difference, uh, but significant in LDL. Uh, in the other risk factors, we didn't see a difference. So we, went back and thought about this, and actually um, we had an opportunity to do a subsequent trial before we had, before this trial was finished. But even then, we were looking at, along the way, what were we learning about the intervention? And a point I'd make again um, is that uh, a lot of this kind of co complex interventions, you have to be following what happens along the way, how is it implemented, 
Um, what are you learning as you, impl as you implement this? And that's where a lot of the knowledge is. So we, one of the things that, even though we thought that these group clinics were such a great idea for getting at the lifestyle issues, what we learned was that it was still very difficult for people to come into the medical center to have a group clinic. There weren't very many of them. It was taking other staff's time to help get them all in. Um, and um, sometimes there were no-shows, so they weren't a group clinic. And I'm giving you the shortcut version of this. So as we thought about the pathway to control of blood pressure, there's sort of both a medication piece and a lifestyle habit piece. And we did think that this was very important and perhaps that even though the um, uh, care managers were, were getting a, a, a handle on medication adherence, um, the lifestyle issues were under, <coughs> under uh, uh, under um, ad addressed. So thinking back again to the chronic care model, remember there's this whole community component. And when this model came out and over the subsequent 10 or 20 years as people were thinking about implementing this model, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on the health system changes and not as much on the community side. And as we thought about this, um, we had to go back to Bob Dylan. No, we didn't do that. <laughs> I had to put Dylan in because it's, the title is Bringing It All Back Home. And uh, this, for those of you who don't know, is a really a landmark album that was very pivotal in rock history. Um, but the title is mostly what I was focusing on. We thought about where does healthcare happen? And again, this, we aren't the only people to be thinking about this. There's sort of a whole change in thinking about it. And that is, a lot of it happens in your home, in your community, involves your family in a major way. Um, even for a condition like stroke or stroke prevention. And then we'd done work in dementia care delivery where we targeted caregivers and patients. And we knew the caregivers were key for that kind of an intervention. Um, we thought, well, with stroke, it's really the, the patient. They're not cognitively impaired. And what we learned was actually it, has, it really is a family affair, again, at least in, in under-resourced settings. So there had been a, a, a literature on community health workers scattered around, <clears throat> it's been around for quite a while, more often focused on child maternal health, infectious diseases, a lot of work going on in lower middle income countries, but there's been a lot of interest and we were interested in possibly applying this in the safety net. And so we uh, looked to uh, Jerry Lynn Allen and a group out of um, Hopkins had done a trial of um, uh, uh, individuals at federally qualified community health centers who had risk factors for, uh, uh, had atherosclerotic disease risk factors and randomized them to a team intervention of a nurse practitioner with a community health worker versus uh, usual care. And they really focused on behavioral interventions for lifestyle changes, adherence to medications and appointments, prescription and titration of medications. Um, they had some tools they developed, and bottom line was they were able to show a, a, an effect across the board on the risk factors that were being targeted. So uh, we looked at this literature, we reviewed actually all the literature on, on this, and so we were um, uh, intrigued at the idea of, of learning from our prior study and expanding it so that this next model of, this tr of, a, of an intervention it's going to involve a team that included the community health worker partnering uh, in care with the nurse practitioner PA, but addressing different issues um, and able to make home visits. I mean, literally, they, they go, they're bilingual, they go to, into the home, they work with the families in the home, they can watch them take their blood pressure with their monitor, they can do all kinds of other uh, coaching to, to ad advance their self-management uh, skills and to work with the families. And we were also thinking about, this reflects the transportation barriers of our patients, but also how do you sustain an intervention? Because we couldn't have nurse practitioners and PAs doing a lot of um, work like this or this wouldn't be sustainable. Um, so the, uh, as I said, we had an opportunity while we were wrapping up the SUSTAIN trial to apply for an initiative uh, from NINDS, again, coming out of a framework of we need to develop interventions and disparities. And, and NINDS had actually very little, a bit, had very little portfolio on health disparities. And in 2012, 
um, uh, uh, announced uh, uh, for these centers on prevention interventions. So all the centers had to have intervention trials as well as some training and community engagement components. And within, um, we were successful in this application and within it, our, our, one of our trials was a secondary stroke prevention trial we called SUCCEED. It has a long thing that we pulled the letters out to get, get to that. But basically the goals were to get people from under-resourced communities to make these changes to reduce the chance of a stroke and a second stroke. So again, we built on our sustained implementation findings, what we learned about transportation issues as we thought we looked at the literature about community health workers, team care. We incorporated home visits. We incorporated chronic disease self-management programs that were delivered in the community by the community health workers as facilitators. And we incorporated mobile health technology, and I confess that that was because the RFA required it. <laughs> it wasn't that we were thinking about it. But as we did, we had to think kind of deeply about what would make sense. And um, as we, we identified um, colleagues um, from this field to, to work with, um, they said, well, basically, it has to either improve the effectiveness of your care delivery or the efficiency or both or don't bother doing it. So as we thought about it, we said, I, we think that what we need is to apply the technology um, to support the coordination of care between the community health worker and the care manager so that they're not emailing or sending paper around um, and the community health worker is in the field and needs a way to be able to remotely retrieve data, display it graphically in the home, uh, print things, uh, for uh, patients in the home, assist in bus transportation routes. So all this um, was built into a, a mobile health app with a desktop application um, that, we, um, that was used by the, the care managers. And then it, we, the goal is this would increase efficiency. We partnered with a, with a company that had, that actually, Demagi Corporation, it's open source platform, so all of the things that were developed in the course of our project is, is available, um, uh, as I said, open source. And uh, the company actually said, oh great, you're our first domestic project. So they have been supporting projects around the world with community health workers around um, maternal and child health and different kinds of issues. We were really pushing the envelope with them to develop, um, uh, expand the app so that it would support care coordination. And this is just an example of, again, it's the idea there's decision guidance, there's an assessment um, modules for the different risk factors that the community health worker can select. Um, and then it prompts them to, to get recordings in the home, uh, find out what barriers are and so forth. Um, it can trigger care plans that are built into the modules as well. So they have those at their fingertips for each of the risk factors. This took, we thought it would take nine, six to nine months to develop. It took longer and then about um, as we rolled it out, what you find in any kind of an implementation process, whether it's, it's in Mount Sinai Health System or whether it's in a research project, is you have to track how it's implemented and make adjustments along the way. So we're in close communication with our care teams every week and with the app developer and making modifications to enhance it. This is the conceptual model, which is the mobile technology as a platform that support, supports the linking of the healthcare system with the community. Community health worker is sort of the bridge. Um, if we increase coordination and communication, this should improve self-management, self-efficacy, et cetera, et cetera, improve medication adherence, lead to improvements in the primary outcome and um, in the other secondary outcomes and global risk reduction. And here's just a schematic of of the minimum protocol, it can be tailored if you have a family, a patient where it's a lot tougher what's going on. A number of people in the county system, their first stroke is when they found out that they had undiagnosed diabetes, undiagnosed hypertension. So this, is, this means that on top of everything else, you have to learn how to manage these chronic diseases and, they, and this was an unknown, unknown setting for you and your, your family. Um, so the goals of this trial were really to first further refine and develop this community-centered component that we were adding to our previous chronic care model, then test it again in a large randomized trial of 500 adults, and also conduct a cost analysis. Because again, our goal is not to just do it and say, publish it and say, 
okay, now on to the next project, but we really want to see data collected that can support sustainability um, if it is effective. We're currently, um, uh, we're over halfway through enrollment. We've enrolled about 275. It's one-to-one -one randomization into intervention and usual care with some stratification. Um, we've, um, we've also learned about, um, remember I showed you the graph that there's some reductions in blood pressure. There were some new blood pressure guidelines that came out. I'm sure that's familiar to all of you. So we raised the threshold for enrollment in the study because part of this is thinking, who do we want to target? Who, who's going to benefit the most? And we think it's going to be people with, with worse risk factor control. Again, over 90% will be minority, two-thirds English speaking. And I just put this here to show you that we have different ways that we're working with um, 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 some colleagues in uh, anthropology and organizational science about um, understanding what's going on in the implementation of this intervention, uh, doing an ongoing evaluation, an implementation evaluation, learning. So for example, one thing that we learned from our care teams is this is really is a family affair. We, we need rooms big enough for that first clinic visit where we bring in everybody and we, we empower and activate them. So think about this. Um, we teach people about, you know, the, what are you supposed to do if you have symptoms of a stroke? Call 911, right? Um, one of the, the biggest things that keeps us from having higher acute stroke treatment is that people, you know, they ignore their symptoms or they, uh, my favorite is uh, when I was last uh, attending at the VA, um, we had like three or four patients in a row referred to neurology who said, yeah, I had those symptoms two weeks ago, but I had a, an upcoming podiatry appointment, so I thought I'd wait and tell my podiatrist at the VA when I came in. So there's people who just don't realize it, and then there are people who the family member drives them. And so um, one of the things that came up is, well, you could teach the patient to call 911, but who's going to be there trying to talk them out of it or um, maybe they're not able to talk, right? So you've got to like let everybody in their, their network know about this education or it's not going to be very effective. And the same thing around risk factor control. So we're, we are um, assessing these things and making modifications as we go. Um, I just wanted to say a couple more things about, um, I showed you a, a, the sustained trial. There was, there was actually a reduction over time in blood pressure, and I think it's really important. I've seen literature out there where people publish single arm observational studies and then claim, oh, we, had our, we did something and it had an effect. And of course, um, even, you know, you wouldn't do that with a drug trial. You wouldn't draw conclusions from a drug trial with a single arm. Well, the same thing with healthcare innovations at an evidence generation stage. There may be an appropriate time for that when you're doing pre-post rollouts of, of, a, of, a, of an innovation, but for, for um, a purpose of, of knowledge generation in this kind of rigorous setting, you, you need the comparison. And this issue of the lack of availability of a composite measure. So we actually have one of our fellows is, is actually doing a project to look to develop a, a composite outcome measure. And when you think about it, we have an intervention that's targeting multiple risk factors, but we can only report one as, as the primary outcome, and that's, um, that's a real limitation. This is a schematic of the different kinds of um, partners involved in this research, from implementation science to mobile health technology, stats, outcomes evaluation. We're collecting biomarkers and our study sites and our community partners. I just want to say briefly that uh, this U54, the Stroke Prevention Intervention Research Program, is one of four around the U.S. We have three projects. One's a secondary stroke prevention, I told you. One's a primary prevention to promote walking among uh, low-income seniors by teaching senior center staff about a behavioral intervention, and they're looking at if that's effective to scale that nationally. And a third project to look at trends in traditional and novel stroke risk factors from NHANES data that's led by Arlene Brown. We have four cores, including a very active community engagement outreach and dissemination core, which has been just essential. And finally, I just want to make a few comments about, um, again, as I alluded to, the purpose of this research is really much closer to um, 
uh, taking into um, action, either in healthcare systems or through policy changes, back to federal agencies and to the community. And the community can be very um, active partners in helping you uh, communicate the findings back to make a difference. So for example, if this, this intervention is effective, we would go back to the DHS administrators and say, here's the effectiveness, here's the cost data, uh, here's the training curriculum we've already developed for community health workers to develop them to be able to do this. Here's all the tools that you need. You know, we would encourage you to implement this program within the system. Or for policy, it can be things like, um, uh, you know, if you find that uh, you can't affect diet because of where the fruits and vegetables are sold in, in these neighborhoods, then you may be going to your local legislators and saying, we need to figure out some strategies to promote um, different kinds of access to um, diet that's going to promote better health and so forth. Our community is a very strong uh, force in, or can be, in helping to make these changes because ultimately they're the ones that care. It's their communities that are affected and they often have a lot of access to um, policymakers. We have a, an internal retreat every year. Here's a photograph from last year's. We just had our other one last, last two weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> And um, uh, we also have a training component and we're, we're looking to develop um, uh, researchers who will take this agenda forward. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first, congratulations on uh, choosing such a uh, off-putting illness like stroke. It hasn't been so popular in medicine. So it's great that you've embraced this. Secondly, as you probably know, we have a geriatric department here at Sinai and a geriatric program within the Department of Medicine. So my next comment is linked to those geriatric. It, it's pretty startling to me that at birth, black children, I don't know the exact figure, live to about age 65 on average, and white children live to age about 70 or 71. But when all of those folks reach age 65, they all have the same life expectancy from that moment on. And that sort of embraces your point about the importance of social and non-genetic aspects of the black-white discrepancy in stroke. Uh, well put. <clears throat> yes. You know, basic to all your efforts are lifestyle changes. And you, obviously, you need the commitment of the patient. And to enhance that, if you had a liaison person with all of the multiple ethnic groups that you have, that liaison person could be educated and would help with the education of, of the people involved in his minority section. Yeah, so um, the, um, I think you're alluding to part of what we learned. We had started out with more of a focus on the patient, and then as this was being rolled out, the care teams were saying, really, we find it's a family and friends, whoever they want to invite to be engaged in this. And then the, the, the community health worker is also that tie to the home, can go in the home and see how, you know, if who's buying the groceries and who's who's um, checking the blood pressure measurements and, and how to help make sure that that respect or information is reinforced and communicated back. Some of the um, strategies that we've been codifying, we're trying to collect these and codify them because often, you know, we don't look into the, there's been a paucity of literature on what goes on inside the interventions and then it's very frustrating when people want to try to replicate them because they don't know exactly how things were done or what people learned along the way. So for example, um, um, we've um, developed a strategy where the stroke patient is charged with being in a way the, 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 the person who's the champion to educate the family and the network around them. Um, when they finish the program, they get a graduation certificate. Um, other ways to really um, activate folks and keep them engaged because ultimately they're going to be responsible for their own health care. The ultimate change is going to be educating the children because they will mm -hmm. now be in an atmosphere of their care. That's a really great point, yeah. <coughs> so uh, Medicaid uh, programs vary from state to state 
because the states determine what the eligibility is going to be for, for the uh, Medicaid approval. Is there any evidence that a stingy state has worse outcomes than a uh, less stingy state? Well, I don't know that, but I think if somebody hasn't studied that, that would be a great idea. I don't know. And as a follow-up, I would think that for a program like yours, you're presumably supported by some kind of grant, but when it comes to implementing generally, it's going to depend upon the Medicaid programs, the Medicare programs, and I suspect that if the state is stingy for Medicaid, that there won't be so much uh, available to implement anything. Yeah. So this is where you get into um, having a view that I'm stuck with the situation as it is versus a view of these things can be changed or modified. And I think that um, as an investigator, uh, the, first, the first trial that we did was a dementia care delivery. We doubled quality of care. It, it was just so incredibly high impact. It was, we published this in 2006. We thought, oh, everybody will want to do this because it just produces better outcomes and everything. We went around and people said, oh, it's really lovely, but how would we pay for it? Lo and behold, 10 years later, CMS is revolutionized. They have their innovations program with a billion dollars of funding to take evidence-based models and scale them up. They got 5,000 applications or 3,000 applications. They had 5,000 letters, 3,000 applications, and funded 100 of these. So there was a, a lot of pent-up you know, um, um, models of different ways of delivering care that uh, people were ready to take. Because what Medicare said in this innovations round was, if over three years you can show that you produce better outcomes, you save money, we will, and you propose a payment strategy for that, we will adopt it. We'll adopt the payment strategy. So that, I thought, that kind of a possibility seemed like impossible 10 years ago. But those are the kind of policy changes, and then under shared risk arrangements, under the Affordable Care Act, there are more possibilities of taking these kind of models because if they improve outcomes, if they can reduce costs, and you have to think about whose costs and over what time frame, um, there's the possibility now that the payment systems are changing in a way that they can be taken up. So uh, sometimes those changes aren't fast enough, but there are opportunities now that we haven't seen before. And as I was saying, that's another reason why having our community partners who can also um, help us advocate for changes um, at least um, in the long run, or even locally. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.